Good afternoon. We're delighted to welcome you to the third of our four-part webinar series in which we're looking at how you can resolve your construction dispute. Today we're focusing on arbitration. Just before we begin, to minimise background noise, I've placed you all on mute. And if you would like to ask any questions, please do so using the webinar chat function. I'll answer some of these at the time, at the end, sorry, time permitting. I am Kate Gillis. I'm a senior assistant in the construction and special project team specialising in construction engineering dispute resolution and based in Edinburgh. I'm joined today by Lee, an assistant in my team. Um, both Lee and I regularly advise on construction contract issues and disputes acting for employers, contractors, subcontractors and consultants across a full range of dispute issues, project types and contracts. We will start today with a brief review of the background, history and the statutory basis of arbitration in Scotland. Our webinar will then focus on the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010. Firstly, what actually is arbitration? Arbitration has been defined by Professor Walker as the adjudication of a dispute on fact or law or both, otherwise than by an ordinary civil court, by one or more persons to whom the parties are at issue have been by agreement validly referred the matter for decision as to their rights in relation to one another. This definition was framed before the 2010 Act, but as the 2010 Act does not define arbitration, it remains a useful description as to what is involved in arbitration. Practically, arbitration is a private dispute resolution forum which represents an alternative to court proceedings. Arbitration involves parties agreeing to submit a dispute to a third party who effectively acts as a private judge in order to produce a binding determination on the parties. The arbitration will normally be someone with expertise in the subject matter of the dispute, in construction disputes for example, a surveyor, architect or engineer. Parties have input into the process and procedure of the arbitration. Although in practice the court model is often followed, there is an effort to move away from this as arbitration has the potential to be quicker and cheaper than court, but only if the process is run effectively. One of the reasons that arbitration fell out of favour in Scotland is that it was taking just as long, if not longer, than court to resolve disputes, but the flexible nature of the process means that this needn't be the case. One of the main advantages is that arbitration is entirely confidential. Before the enactment of the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010, the law relating to arbitration in Scotland was outdated and unsatisfactory. The foundations of the modern law of arbitration in Scotland had been laid down by the judiciary in the 19th century, supplemented by irregular legislation on discrete aspects of arbitration, and in the absence of a comprehensive set of rules, the law was unclear and inaccessible. Matters such as the extent of the arbitrator's powers and the procedures to be adopted were left largely in the hands of the parties. While this allowed the parties a certain amount of freedom, failure to agree certain basic features diminished the effectiveness of arbitration as a method of resolving disputes. For example, at common law, an arbiter, as they used to be called, had no power to award damages or to order payment of interest on any award. The power to award interest was of particular importance, given that it was not unheard of for arbitration proceedings to take eight years or more. Scottish arbitration law was therefore regarded as being unfit for purpose in the modern commercial environment. In Scotland, the legislation that now governs arbitration is the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010. The 2010 Act was introduced to provide a modern statutory framework for domestic and international arbitration in Scotland and to provide a cost-effective and efficient method for resolving disputes. The Act came into force with effect from the 7th of June 2010, but it is important to note that the Act applies retrospectively to existing arbitration clauses and contracts, which were concluded prior to the date of commencement. The Act introduces a codified set of Scottish arbitration rules, which are intended to be comprehensive and to address the perceived inadequacies on the grounds of cost, delay and lack of certainty in the outcome, of Scotland as a centre for arbitration, particularly on the international front. The underlying principle remains the same as was previously in Scotland. Arbitration involves parties agreeing to submit a dispute to a third party who to all intents and purposes acts as a private judge in order to produce a binding determination on the parties. The intention is that the parties then give up their right to go to court or use some other means of dispute resolution. However, the Act gave arbitration more teeth and introduce new elements in the manner in which arbitrations are conducted. So, looking at the Act itself, there are two component parts, 
firstly the main body of the Act, which are in sections 1 to 37, and then Scottish arbitration rules, which form Schedule 1 to the Act. The rules themselves are further distinguished between mandatory rules, which cannot be contracted out of, and discretionary rules, which can be, with the prior agreement of both parties to the contract. This means that parties agreeing to use arbitration as a means of dispute resolution in their contract need to consider in advance to what extent the discretionary rules should be amended for dealing with their disputes. In the absence of agreement to the contrary, all of the discretionary rules will apply by default. Section 1 of the Act mirrors the opening section of the English Arbitration Act um, 1996 and reflects the three key principles of the Arbitration Act of 2010. The first principle, fairness and the efficient determination of the dispute, is given effect through an express duty on the arbitrator or the panel of arbitrators, together referred to as the tribunal, to act independently and impartially and to avoid incurring unnecessary delay and expense. This appears to be common sense, but given how some arbitrations proceeded prior to the Act, these express duties are welcomed. The second principle, party autonomy to influence the procedure and the course of the arbitration, reflects the underlying precept that the party should have the power to decide how the arbitration is to proceed, subject to provisions that are necessary in the public interest. This is reflected in the default provisions in the arbitration rules, which apply only insofar as the parties do not agree to modify or to disapply them. The third principle is a corollary of the second, reflecting the party's choice to resolve their dispute by arbitration rather than by litigation. The Act confers upon the courts an intentionally limited power of intervention, restricted to certain specific matters, with the aim of supporting rather than overseeing the arbitration. So how does an arbitration begin? Well, a party commences an arbitration by giving notice to the other party that he or she intends to submit a dispute to arbitration in accordance with the arbitration agreement between them. The arbitration agreement will often set out the procedure for the appointment of an arbitrator or arbitrators to determine the dispute. The 2010 Act makes it clear that an arbitration agreement can be either an ad hoc contract of submission or an ancillary arbitration clause which forms part of another contract. An ad hoc submission is entered into where there is an existing dispute or set of disputes between the parties and they agree between them to submit this to arbitration. An ancillary arbitration clause is included in a contract where the parties wish to ensure that if any disputes or differences, either general or particular, arise in the future in connection with this contract, then they will be submitted to arbitration. Where the arbitration agreement is silent on the actual process of appointment, a default rule provides that the parties must jointly appoint an arbitrator within 28 days of either party requesting the other to do so, and this is set out in Rule 6 of the Scottish Arbitration Rules. Where the appointment procedure fails, either party may seek the appointment of an arbitrator by an arbitral appointments referee. The Arbitral Appointments Referee Scotland Order 2010 authorises a number of bodies to act as arbitral appointments referees, including the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, for example. Notice of the party's intention to seek the appointment of an arbitrator must be communicated to the other party. Provided there is no objection within seven days, the arbitral appointments referee may proceed to appoint an arbitrator to determine the dispute. Either party may apply to the court to appoint an arbitrator where a party objects to the appointment of an arbitrator by the appointments referee or the referee fails to make an appointment within 21 days. The court's decision on that matter is final. When appointing an arbitrator, the referee or the court must have regard to the nature and subject matter of the dispute. Rule 8 provides that the arbitrator has to disclose any conflict of interest, and Rule 10 provides that any party to an arbitration has the right to challenge the appointment of a particular arbitrator. A default rule provides that, in the first instance, the tribunal themselves may determine any challenge, although either party may seek the removal of an arbitrator by the court. The arbitrator will be removed if he is not impartial and independent, does not treat the parties fairly, or there is a risk of substantial injustice. As we have set out then, arbitral proceedings are dictated by a series of default rules from the 2010 Act, which may be modified or disapplied by the parties, as well as those clearly set out in the powers of the tribunal in relation to various matters. Rule 28 of the Scottish Arbitration Rules provide that it is for the tribunal to determine the procedure to be followed in the arbitration, as well as the admissibility, relevance, materiality and weight of any evidence given. 
This rule was relied upon by the arbitration judge in the case of arbitration application number C of 2011 in Scotland, where he refused a decision to the tribunal's decision to, sorry, a challenge to the tribunal's decision to strike out as irrelevant affirmance relating to a tender issued by a contractor that was not a party to the action. The powers of the tribunal under this rule extend to the timing and format of written submissions by the parties. <laughs> Sorry, we've just got some interference here, sorry. Just make sure you're all on mute, thank you. Um, and the scope and nature of any witness evidence, including the ability to strike out affirmance as irrelevant. The tribunal also has wide powers to determine the format and scope of any hearing. The further, following further procedural provisions apply under the Arbitration Act 2010. The tribunal is authorised to issue such directions to the parties as it considers appropriate for the purposes of conducting the arbitration. The tribunal may appoint a clerk to assist it in conducting the arbitration, although the party's consent is required for any appointment in respect of which significant expenses are likely to arise. Historically, arbitrators would typically appoint a solicitor or an advocate as a clerk for administrative purposes and to deal with any legal issues that may arise during the arbitration. Although the role of the legal clerk was intended to be reduced in arbitrations which are to be carried out under the Arbitration Act 2010 Act. A party may be represented in an arbitration by a lawyer or by another person. Also, the tribunal may obtain an expert opinion on any matter arising in the arbitration, providing that the parties are given a reasonable opportunity to consider and respond to any evidence. Where any party fails to comply with the deadline for submitting a claim or defence, the tribunal is given the power to dismiss the claim or to proceed to determine the matter in the absence of a defence. Where a party fails to attend a hearing or comply with a direction of the tribunal, the tribunal may proceed with the arbitration on the basis of the evidence before it, or it may draw an adverse inference from such non-compliance. The parties may agree to consolidate the arbitration with another arbitration, such as parallel proceedings in which the respondent claims an indemnity from another party, or to hold concurrent hearings, although this may not be done on the initiative of the tribunal alone. Thanks, Lee. Um, looking now at the powers of the court in relation to arbitration, in accordance with the finding principles, these powers are limited and are intended to support arbitral proceedings rather than interfere with them. Default Rule 41 provides that the court may determine any point of Scots law arising in the arbitration on the application by any party. This reflects what was previously the stated case procedure under the old arbitration law, which allowed either party, subject to any express term in the arbitration agreement to the contrary, to effectively require the arbitrator to refer a question of law to the inner house of the Court of Session, which is a bench of at least three judges sitting. The stated case procedure could easily be, and regularly was, used by a party to significantly delay the determination of the dispute by the arbitrator, and it was almost certainly a contributory factor in the decline in the use of arbitration. The new arbitration rules, therefore, introduced a number of safeguards to prevent the misuse of the procedure. Parties are also free to decide that this procedure should not apply at all. Parties may decide to dispense with the option of referring a matter of law to the court if, for example, they have confidence in the arbitrator and the sums in dispute do not merit the expense of a reference to court. Where the default rule does apply, though, an application for determination of a point of law is valid only if the parties agree that such an application must be made or the tribunal allows the application to be made and the court is satisfied that there is good reason why the question needs to be determined by the court. The rule is therefore designed to limit excessive or unwarranted applications. The tribunal may continue with the arbitration pending the determination of the application to court. Unlike the stated case procedure, all matters referred to the court are to be determined by a single judge sitting at first instance, otherwise, sorry, unless otherwise specified, and the decision of the single judge is not subject to appeal. The court also has an important role in supporting the arbitration process in that they may order any person to attend a hearing for the purposes of giving evidence, or they may require any person, including a person who is not a party to the arbitration, to disclose documents or other material evidence to the tribunal on the same basis as in civil proceedings. 
The Act also contains rules conferring statutory powers on the arbitrator in respect of the awards that can be made. Rule 48 of the Scottish Arbitration Rules provides that the Tribunal has the power to order payment of a sum of money, including a sum in respect of damages. The Tribunal may also order that interest be paid on any sums found to be due. These rules correct two fundamental shortcomings in the previous law under which the arbitrator has no power to award either damages or interest. Default Rule 49 of the Scottish Arbitration Rules gives the Tribunal the power to make an award of a declaratory nature as well. They are also able to order a party to do or to refrain from doing something, and historically these sorts of powers were generally available only to the court, such as in an action for specific implement or interdict. Default Rule 49 also allows the arbitrator or tribunal to order the rectification or reduction of a deed or document. The parties may also decide that the tribunal has the power to make a provisional award, which would include payment of a sum of money, or an order to do or refrain from doing something on an interim basis, which in court would be known as interim interdict. Similar to adjudication, the Scottish Arbitration Rules also have a slip rule which allows the tribunal to correct any clerical or typographical errors and also to clarify or to remove any ambiguity in the award. This mirrors the English approach in the English Arbitration Act 1996. Such an amendment can be made at the initiative of the tribunal or on application by any party, provided that the application is made within 28 days of the award. Just a quick note on expenses in the arbitration procedure. Unlike adjudication, in arbitration the parties are severally liable for the tribunal's fees and expenses, including the expenses of any clerk or expert that has been appointed by the tribunal. The arbitrator's fees may be charged at a reasonable commercial rate, and in the first instance the parties are liable for an equal share of the tribunal's fees and expenses. A default rule allows the tribunal to make an award allocating the party's liability for recoverable arbitration expenses, and this would include the arbitrator's fees and expenses as well as the legal expenses of the other party to the arbitration. In making any award of expenses, the tribunal is expressly required to have regard to the normal rule that expenses should follow success, except where this is inappropriate in the circumstances. Similar to court proceedings, the tribunal may order a party to provide security for expenses up front. Moving on to rights of challenge. In terms of challenging the decision of an arbitrator, the grounds are limited, which is in keeping with the principle of minimal interference by the court. A party may only apply to the court to review a decision of the tribunal in the following limited circumstances. These are where there is a lack of substantive jurisdiction, a serious irregularity in the process, or an appeal on the point of law. The first two grounds are within the mandatory rules and cannot be disapplied, while the right to appeal on a point of law can be modified or disapplied by the parties. Thanks, Kate. The substantive jurisdiction ground is set out in Rule 67 of the Scottish Arbitration Rules. While the Tribunal has the power to rule on its own jurisdiction, that power is subject to review by the Court. The Court may confirm, vary or set aside the decision of the Tribunal for this. The second ground, serious irregularity, will include, include sorry, any irregularity which has caused or will cause substantial injustice to the appellant. This will include things such as failure to conduct the arbitration in accordance with the arbitration agreement or the arbitration rules, failure of the tribunal to deal with all the issues submitted to it, an arbitrator not being impartial or independent, or an arbitration not, arbitrator sorry, not having treated the parties fairly. A party may appeal against the tribunal's award on the grounds that the tribunal also erred on a point of law. An appeal may only be made by agreement between the parties or with the leave of the court. The court will only grant leave to appeal on this error, point of error of law where one of the following applies. Firstly, that the point at issue substantially affects the party's rights and the tribunal's decision on the point was so obviously wrong. Or the court considers the point to be of general importance and the tribunal's decision is open to serious doubt. Applications to the court are heard by a single judge sitting in the outer house of the court of session and will be considered on paper unless the court is satisfied that a hearing is necessary. We'll take now just a brief comparison with the English Arbitration Rules, um, which are in the English Arbitration Act 1996. 
So the Scottish Act shares a number of common features with the English Arbitration Act. Um, both jurisdictions share the fundamental principles of fairness, party autonomy and limited court intervention, which are reflected throughout the provisions of the Arbitration Act 2010 and in the Arbitration Rules. Concepts such as the separability of arbitration agreements, consolidation of arbitration proceedings and the correction of errors by the introduction of a slip rule reflect similar provisions in England as well as in other jurisdictions. And the procedures for challenging the jurisdiction of the tribunal and the process for challenging awards also broadly follow the position in England. As a result, the Scottish courts have held that cases on the Arbitration Act 1996 in England are relevant as guidance when interpreting the Arbitration Act 2010. Uh, this is a statement that was made by Lord Glenny, who was the first of the arbitration, dedicated arbitration judges, and that was in the Arbitration Application No. 3 of 2011. The Arbitration Act 2010 also contains a number of provisions which improve upon or fill in perceived blanks in the English model. In particular, there is an express and detailed confidentiality provision as a default rule, rather than relying on the common law, which is the position in England. The Arbitration Act 2010 also covers oral agreements to arbitrate, which again are governed by the common law in England. The Scottish rules also resolve the difficulty in England as to which law applies to the arbitration agreement by providing that where Scotland is the seat of the arbitration, Scots law will apply unless stated otherwise. Before concluding our webinar, we thought it would be useful to make you aware that the results of the first Scottish arbitration survey were recently published, reporting on the uptake of arbitration in Scotland in 2013 to 2014 and on the evolution of arbitration since the advent of the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010. The report concludes that around 22 arbitrations took place in Scotland between the 1st of July 2013 and the 30th of June 2014. However, it is acknowledged that obtaining an accurate figure for the number of arbitration proceedings is not straightforward, not least because the figure is derived from the survey responses received. There is no guarantee that responses were submitted by all of those involved in arbitration in Scotland, or that full disclosure was made due to the confidential nature of arbitration proceedings. This may mean that there are numbers of arbitrations um, which have been, and it's been understated. As you will be aware, arbitration has traditionally been used in construction and property disputes, but the report identifies that there is a potential growth area for the use of arbitration, including an area such as family law, sports-related disputes, and consumer and lower value disputes. It remains to be seen whether or not arbitration in these areas will expand as predicted and much will depend upon the perception of arbitration of both advisors and clients. The survey reports feedback that lengthy submissions and traditional procedures continue to undermine the arbitration process. The survey entreats arbitrators to exert firmer control over the process so as to exclude these sort of approaches. This is only the first report of the Scottish Arbitration Survey so the statistical analysis is of limited value on its own. What will be far more interesting is when comparative data becomes available so that trends in the use of arbitration as an alternative dispute resolution process can be identified. We thought it would also be useful to draw your attention to two further matters just before concluding. Uh, firstly, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators has published a short form of rules which provides a fast-track route to obtaining a binding decision from an arbitrator with limited recourse to the courts. Um, these rules are designed to cover disputes for the value of up to £25,000 plus VAT. They can be used for higher value uh, disputes by agreement of, between the parties. Under the rules, a short form of arbitration um, should be finished within 77 days, so the timetable that is set out is as follows. The arbitrator will set out directions for the conduct of the arbitration within 14 days of it being raised. A statement of claim by the claimant is then produced within a further 14 days and the respondent will get 21 days to prepare its statement of defence. The claimant then has an opportunity to respond to the defence and that's a seven day timetable and the respondent has a similar opportunity to respond again within seven days and the arbitrator's award requires to be published within 14 days, although they can declare an extension of seven days or longer with permission of the parties. It is perhaps worth remembering that these rules exist when considering arbitration as an option for smaller disputes. 
we've now come to the end of the formal part of the presentation. Um, we hope that that's been useful and interesting, and we do still have a few minutes um, to answer questions. We've got quite a few questions, so we'll see um, if we can get through a few of those. So one of the first questions we've got is, um, in what circumstances would you recommend that parties resolve their dispute by arbitration rather than any other dispute mechanism? I'm not sure if you want to answer that, Kate. Um, yeah, there would be a number of reasons potentially why you would look at arbitration as a resolution rather than any of the other um, dispute mechanisms that we've spoken about in our other webinars. Um, as we've mentioned, arbitration is confidential and binding, um, so if parties have particular sensitivities about the issues in dispute, then arbitration would be a good option. Um, with adjudication, for example, you would get the confidentiality, but it's only a temporarily binding decision, so arbitration might be suitable in those circumstances. Um, you might also have circumstances where parties are bound to arbitrate um, because of the clauses in the contract. So, again, you would use arbitration in those circumstances other than if it can be agreed by the parties that you do otherwise. Um, and I think a final factor possibly to consider there would be if there's a cross-border element to the dispute, you might prefer to go to arbitration rather than litigating in an unfamiliar jurisdiction. Another question we've got here is quite a useful one. It says the commercial court um, is now considered to be quite slick in Scotland, so does that mean that arbitrations are perhaps now a thing of the past? I think we covered this briefly in the webinar, but I think it will be difficult um, to fully ascertain how many arbitrations are being taken up due to the confidential nature of the process, but it is our experience that with the success of the commercial court, it does mean that arbitrations are more few and far between. I think the intention was the 2010 Act would, um, have been, would try and encourage arbitration, and we're still seeing that coming through, um, as although the Act came about in 2010, that is still relatively new, um, and so we will continue to wait and see what happens. Uh, but time for one final question. Um, if the arbiter's final decision steps outside the brief and finds incorrectly, um, can they cherry pick the decision? Can the parties cherry pick the decision, or is the whole decision set aside? I think with that one, it would depend what was meant by find, in, finding it incorrectly. Um, because if it was an issue about going out with the jurisdiction, then there is a risk then that the whole award would then be um, would be subject to challenge, and so it would be the whole award that would then be looked at. However, if it was a point of law and, for example, the arbitrator was looking at four elements and it was only one of those points, then an application could be made to the court just to look at one of those. Um, it would also depend whether this was the final award on all of the disputes or whether, it was, for example, arbitrators sometimes have a partial award and it's, it's relevant to say that both of these can be taken to court for challenge and are subject to the grounds that we've addressed in this webinar. Um, just one final question now. Uh, if the parties to a contract agree to arbitration in the contract provisions, but subsequently both agree they would rather take the dispute to court, is this permissible? Yes, it is. Um, it's only if one party wants to rely upon the arbitration agreement that they would um, make that objection when you made um, litigation. So if you've agreed before going to court that that's what both parties want to do, then that's fine and you can disregard the arbitration provision in the contract. Okay, so yeah, well, I think that's the last of all of our questions and great to see that we had quite a few um, for this webinar and that's our time up for today. We do hope that you've enjoyed this webinar and found it informative and useful and we look forward to welcoming you all to future webinars. Thank you very much.